The other day I was looking for a waste-free toothpaste option for a hiking tour. The other day? <laughs> who am I kidding? A long long time ago, before the pandemic, was when I realized that a lot of these toothpaste tablets and also a lot of the toothpaste in tubes actually don't contain fluoride. Actually, they specifically advertise being fluoride-free as if that's a good thing. <laughs> Hello there and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel. I am Susie and we are about to spread some science. I calmed down, made myself a cup of coffee so we can get into the nitty gritty of fluoride in toothpaste. But first things first. To get rid of any misunderstandings, fluorine and fluoride are not at all the same. Fluorine is very toxic due to its high reactivity. Fluoride, on the other hand, is relatively unreactive. Q octet rule. But what does that all mean? If you look into the periodic table, you will find fluorine all the way over here on the right, in the seventh group, also called halogens. Fluorine is in its elemental form a gas, which would remind you in its smell of chlorine gas, like in swimming pools. But I sincerely hope you'll never smell it because it's highly toxic. Because it's in the seventh group of the periodic table, it's missing an electron in its outer shell, which means it wants to react with pretty much everything to fill it. But we won't go into detail too much about this in this video. Important to know is, you won't find elemental fluorine anywhere. Due to its high reactivity, you mostly encounter it already bound to other elements in your daily life and these compounds are completely safe. So safe even that it is basically in an unreactive, also called inert form. And one of those is fluoride. Now why are we putting this super unreactive fluoride into our toothpaste to prevent cavities? How cavities develop. Let's start with how cavities in teeth actually develop. First, what are teeth actually made of? The majority of our enamel is made up of a mineral called hydroxyapatite. To be exact, an impure form of hydroxyapatite. Now, this doesn't mean your teeth are dirty, it means it's chemically impure. But what does that even mean? To understand that, we quickly have to look at what a mineral is in general. Minerals are salts or ionic compounds, like our table salt, sodium chloride, or calcium carbonate, our chalk or limestone in the kitchen. Hydroxyapatite consists of different ions as well, namely calcium phosphate and hydroxy ions. Together, they build a crystal lattice. However, sometimes there are also other ions present in the crystal lattice in our teeth, like for example, carbonate or fluoride ions which means even in a solid material, like our teeth, consisting of a dense crystal structure, it is possible that single ions exchange places with each other. Long story short, our teeth are a mineral that's built up of different ions. Now, how do cavities develop in this? Our teeth are surrounded by a biofilm called plaque. Plaque consistently forms on the surface of our teeth and is home to a multitude of tiny microorganisms. These tiny microorganisms are particularly happy Yay! if we eat carbohydrates, especially sugars, because they need them for their metabolism, which turns carbohydrates and sugars into acids. These produced acids lower their pH in our mouth. And all of this is happening directly on our teeth. So what does this mean for our tooth mineral? It's pretty much exactly the same concept as with our limestone in the kitchen. Limestone, so the calcium carbonate, is so annoying because it is almost insoluble in water, except when we have a low pH. So if we use vinegar or any other acidic remover in our kitchen, the limestone dissolves. And the same happens with our teeth. The mineral dissolves in acidic environments and voila, we develop cavities. <coughs> Scientists and dentists call this demineralization. How can we now stop these cavities, literally holes, from developing in our teeth? Easy as, with remineralization. Okay, how does that work? 
Let's take a step back to our impure hydroxy appetite. The general rule is the tighter, more dense the crystallite is, the stronger is the crystal structure and the harder it is to dissolve. Exactly that dissolving is the thing we want to stop in our teeth from happening. Different ions usually disturb the crystal lattice when they exchange places with ions in it, with the big exception of fluoride. Fluoride ions are so small when they exchange places with the hydroxide ions in the crystal lattice of hydroxyapatite, the crystal structure becomes more dense and with that more stable. Even with the lowest amount of fluoride ions present, a structure called fluorapatite or fluorohydroxyapatite is called, which is much more stable than hydroxyapatite. In short, this stays stable in acidic environments, this dissolves. No hole, hole. So, as long as fluoride ions are present in our saliva or plug, they can build themselves in the appetite structure and slow down or even completely prevent our enamel from dissolving. This property, that the tooth can basically rebuild itself, is called remineralization. Great! We now know how to successfully prevent our enamel from dissolving and prepare our teeth to rebuild. But surely there is an alternative to fluoride by now. Alternatives to fluoride. Let's go back to those toothpaste tablets I was looking at in the beginning. In most of them, sodium fluoride is replaced by nanohydroxyapatite, so enamel. Brushing your teeth with enamel. That sounds reasonable. If cavities come from dissolving teeth, we just add more tooth on them to prevent the demineralization. Sounds okay, but if we look at this graphic, it seems useless at low pH. From a pH of 5 or lower, the solubility of hydroxyapatite increases rapidly, which means it dissolves faster. So what use is it if we bring in more hydroxyapatite if it gets dissolved right away anyway? If we brush our teeth with fluoride containing toothpaste on the other hand, fluorapatite is formed, which has a significantly lower solubility at low pH. No hole, hole. No, 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 I can already hear the skeptics. This is only my theory, following logic and chemical understanding. Maybe reality paints a different picture. Let's have a look how this trend of fluoride-free, natural labeled toothpaste plays out. The Conversation published an article in 2020 speaking about a tooth decay epidemic based on studies in New Zealand. And it paints a very dark picture for your shiny white smile if we renounce fluoride. Matthew Hobbs, the author of that article, references several studies which show the same as all other research so far. Fluorides help prevent carriers. This is studied extensively and is not at all controversial. Meanwhile, toothpaste producers who actively advertise as natural and dwell on being fluoride free don't show any scientific study to support their claim that it prevents cavities. I took the liberty of having a look into this myself. The most referred publication is a study in which kids got to use toothpaste with and without hydroxyapatite for 30 days. These toothpastes were both not fluoride free, which means this study says absolutely nothing about the hypothesis if hydroxyapatite could replace fluoride or not. Awkward. By the way, I am not denying that hydroxyapatite was studied or that it has positive effects in dental care in general, but it doesn't protect alone against cavities. This specific point was not scientifically proven. Oh, and another point I want to admit. There is of course a multitude of cavity prophylaxis other than fluoride, but we know that fluoride works so fantastically, so why would we want to exchange it? Because it is toxic. <coughs> fluoride equals poison. Can one in principle have too much fluoride? Yes. As with any substance in life, there are limits that shouldn't be exceeded. If you look up studies dealing with the toxicity of fluoride, please look at two things. First, the concentration, and second, the way of exposure, like locally when brushing your teeth or orally through eating and drinking. The probably toxic dose 
for most adults is estimated at 5 mg fluoride per kilogram body weight. The lethal dose is higher and ranges between 32 and 64 mg per kilogram for adults. It gets dangerous when toddlers who weigh much less in body weight than adults eat toothpaste, which is why dentists recommend using a special toothpaste for kids. This is mostly preventative, as you can't always prevent a child from swallowing toothpaste. And if additional fluoride is consumed, for example through food or fluoridation of drinking water, a dental fluorosis can be developed. You can't get fluorosis from normally and regularly brushing your teeth without eating toothpaste, as the fluoride content in toothpaste is regulated to an effective but harmless amount. By the way, the use and contents amount of fluorides are regulated by the TTA since the early 1960s and constantly reviewed on the basis of recent scientific studies. On my current tube of toothpaste, I can find the information 1000 ppm F-, which means every fifth hundredth ion in it is a fluoride ion. I can't even imagine a realistic scenario where one could be exposed to a lethal dose of fluoride outside of a chemistry laboratory. So to summarize, fluoride in toothpaste is good for you. It can be poisonous in high doses, but in a realistic scenario by regularly brushing your teeth without eating toothpaste, you won't die from it and your teeth will stay healthy and strong. In the end, it is up to you. They are your teeth and you can brush them with whatever you want. All I want for you is to be informed and not to panic about chemistry technical terms. And now that you watched this video so far, you have all the info you need and my part here is done. Stay sciencey. Is there anything that you always wanted to know how the science behind it works or what all the fuss is about? Write it in the comments down below and I will see you next time.